I'm down. Let's go. Awesome. So in that blurb, you wrote that you'd been through sexual abuse and you had gone through emotional trauma and you had found your way out to the other side from the darkness. And what I want to start with is where, where did you start? What thoughts or what beliefs did you have about yourself when you came out? So you've gone through sexual trauma, you've gone through the emotional trauma, you're standing there realizing you've gone through all of that. What thoughts and beliefs did you have about yourself back then? I was filled until I was in my forties and the abuse happened when I was eight years old, Mm. but I had so much shame Mm. about myself. I didn't respect myself or love myself at all. And, um, the thoughts that I, the main thought that I believed about myself was I wasn't valuable and, um, and I wasn't worth I didn't have worth and those, those thoughts did not serve me at all. They were terrible thoughts that, um, led to a really bad path. Um, and be between eight years old and 40, I did some great things in there, but I never was able to be the depth of who I am today. Um, because of those thoughts that limited me. Mm. And what, so during your, I'd say during your 20s and 30s, when you're an adult, did you find that those thoughts created relationships, friendships and personal relationships that were kind of not inspiring or enjoyable or they they themselves were fueled with emotional trauma. Um, I kept people at a distance. I yeah. love people. Um, I consider myself an extrovert, mm. but I would let people get so close. So I would pull them in with one hand and push them away with another. Mm-hmm. And I would only let them be so close. So my relationships didn't have depth to them. I still have friends that I had when I was in the third grade. I'm still friends with my best friend from third grade and my best friend from junior high. I still have these people in my life that I clung to and they knew pieces of my story. But at the same time, I really didn't have the depth of relationship to continue to tell them every day and to talk to them every day. And I, I did have friends people I, who I would consider friends through that space and time, but I just push people away because of so much shame and unease in my heart. It wasn't as much as it was some of, I don't trust you, but it was a lot of, I don't trust myself to be a good friend to you because of this brokenness inside of me. Mm. And did that also come out in what you were actively doing, like work-wise or career-wise as well? Yeah, so um, I had different jobs. I always considered myself um, someone who poured myself into my work. And Mm. so my work was my space where I had an identity that I could be an achiever and really climb a ladder pour myself into whatever situation it was that I was doing. And so um, my work was very, a place that I just did that, that I just, whatever, I would keep people at a distance, but I would just overachieve and overachieve to the point where I would be physically burnt out and take responsibilities on myself that, weren't necessarily what my job would require of me, but it would be things that the company that I thought that they would see as, as something they would want done. And so I just really poured myself into every job that I had during that time. Yeah. And did you walk away, were you recognized for the work or did you walk away with resentment because you weren't recognized for the work? So 
most of the time I was recognized from the work, Mm -hmm. but the last job that I had prior to me making a direction change with my life, I walked away from um, that particular position um, that I was in where a manager didn't recognize my value and I couldn't, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't take it because I was working so hard. But at the other jobs that I had prior, every person that I worked for, you know, I, I worked at a school as an um, administrative assistant in an elementary and the, the principal still says to this day, I was the best one he had ever had. And it, it, it it's fulfilling when you work so hard to have that. But then the, the last guy I was put in his store to kind of clean up some stuff and he didn't appreciate my value there. And I, I couldn't stand the environment and not being able to, because I was such a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. I'd Mm -hmm. never being able to feel like I could please him with Mm -hmm. my actions, no matter what I did, it was very hard for me. So then was that the trigger for you to shift? You know, that was the place where I went and I went to the counselor and I went and talked with the counselor really for the first time in my life for myself personally. Mm. And I went for a work issue. And in that space, I was I had been moved from that manager's particular store into some corporate management roles where I was doing claims management for multiple locations. Um, But I was in a room by myself and I couldn't interact with people and be, you know, fulfill that thing within me, that people pleasing thing and have that extroverted conversations with people. And so I went and I would talk to a counselor about it. And in that time, that counselor began to peel back layers. And I, in that space, he kind of prepared the ground for me to be able to open up and peel back the, the layers and to, um, to begin the process of healing. Mm. Mm-hmm. Would you say that would you say that your trauma kind of pushed you more into being an introvert and then you realize you're an extrovert? Well, I at when I was young, I always thought that I was an extrovert just because mm. I was fueled by being around other people. But my trauma made me pull back and isolate from people. And so even though I craved that desire to connect on a deeper level with people, I would only because of the self-protection that I had, you know, I wired my brain from self-protection in such a giant way. Like I, I didn't trust, you know, I, I was sexually abused by my grandfather, but when I told my parents didn't let me, um, talk about it. They said, we can't tell. And so the people in authority over my life wanted me to keep secrets. And Mm. so as a child, that's how I wired my brain. We keep secrets to protect ourselves and to protect our family. And so that's what I did. I just wore that mask over my face at all times. You, you want to show the world you're someone but you don't want them to see who what's really going on behind the closed doors. No one can know that. Mm. And that's, that was how I was raised. And so um, once I began to peel back those layers and really realize, you know, I had to go through the process of dealing with things and facing emotions that were still in there that I really didn't recognize. I didn't allow myself to recognize the process that I needed to go through and heal as a child. And I, I, that, that inner child was still within me and she needed to be recognized and she needed to heal. And I, I just 
learned to show her love and compassion, listen to what she had to say to me so that I could just hug her and bring her forward. And I wasn't even the possibility of a future me is so amazing now because I have so much possibility in front of me in life. And, but until I let her go and I just showed her love and compassion and listened to what she had to say, we all want to be heard. We all want to be seen. And that inner child wanted that for me. And so I gave that to her through that process. I had to forgive. Like I didn't even admit that I was upset ever with my parents. And I had to go through, my dad passed away when he was 39 and I was 16, but I had to go through a process of anger with him mm -hmm. because I finally admitted that I was abused and that I was, you know, that it wasn't right for parents to do that. So as, as a society, it wasn't something people talked about as much as we do today. You know, as a society, we are more open to say this is wrong and it and it needs to be dealt with. It doesn't need to be swept under the rug. That's not OK anymore. And more and more people are doing that rather than sweeping it under the rug. And if I mean, anyone who's been through that, I have so much love and compassion for you. And it's not OK to sweep these things under the rug. It's not OK because it leaves the potential for someone else to be hurt. And so I knew that I could show her love and compassion and heal, go through that process of anger and frustration with my, my parents. In my 40s, it seemed ridiculous, but it was necessary. And I was able to, to accept that and then forgive them and love them in a whole new way. And so I have gone through all of those emotions and have so much love for them. They were doing what society thought was okay. <clears throat> yeah. And I have no anger towards them anymore, but I just had to process and all of that emotion, instead of shoving that emotion inside, We've got to recognize it. We've got to stop ignoring the things that we think are negative emotions and just ex listen, listen to what thoughts our brain is offering to us and why their brain is offering them to us. And when we do that, we're able to look at it, evaluate it and process it instead of holding on to junk inside and just keeping it deep in there. You know, the process of grief, I really didn't allow myself to feel so many different emotions and processing those emotions in a different, unique way and really recognizing them, accepting them, shedding tears when I needed to and allowing myself the space to do that and the space to heal. And I did. And really God helped me through that situation. Hmm. I have so many questions. <laughs> um, I just want to let that sit for a minute because that everything that you just said, I completely resonate with. And I'm so sorry you went through that. And I'm so sorry for all of us. That's because I'm in my 40s. I'm in my late 40s now. And I am, I opened Pandora's box in my 30s or when I was 30 and my dad died when I was 30 and I was my box opened when I was standing wearing a wedding dress getting ready to marry a man I knew I didn't want to marry and I was mm -hmm. marrying him because my people pleaser didn't know how to let everybody down that I that was so excited about the fact that I was getting married and I was standing there listening to a voicemail message on my phone and this was just such a pivotal moment for me uh, <clears throat> that will probably come up a lot over the course of this podcast because it was like this moment where I went wow, there's got to be something more to life than this because I was listening to the voicemail message and it was the nurse saying you need to come your dad is not going to make it through oh. today <clears throat> and 
you need to come now. And I'm standing there in the city in a wedding dress, just hating my life, hating what I was doing, hating all the decisions that I had made. And I looked down and I went that, yep, that would be right. This is just, this is my life. It It is this shit. And it was that moment where I really started going, there has to be something more because most of my abuse had come from my family. It wasn't physical abuse. It was all emotional abuse. And I didn't know that I had been emotionally abused until I was in my 30s and the emotional abuse was still going on, even now in my 40s because my mum and my dad have both passed away. There is someone else in my family now who is still in some way emotionally abusing me um, <clears throat> because she started she get, started giving me the silent treatment when I was 12. I'm now 47 and she still to this day has not talked to me since I was 12. And that people look at that and go, how? It's like that this was just what you did back in those days. You didn't you didn't get on Facebook and you didn't say, you know, what do I do? My kids aren't talking to each other. They hate each other and get that support. It was well, let's just enable it. We'll just keep you. We'll just have you come to family events and, and the other person come to family events and we'll just keep you separated. And so that's what happened. It became the norm and it became the habit. And that, similar to you, the emotional abuse, um, it wasn't just that. It was also my lots of things happened with my mum and my dad and my grandma. Um, but similar to you, I was an extrovert. I was a huge extrovert. But because of the way uh, my sister was and she wasn't a big extrovert, she's a very big introvert, I got punished for being an extrovert. I got punished for having friends. I got punished for being invited to sing in the musical at school. I got, I got punished for a lot of things just for being me, which pushed me into being an introvert and well, pushed me into isolation and pushed mm -hmm. me away from people and and forced me to a point where I would hold people at arm's length. And now, I mean, you're lucky <clears throat> that you still have these people as friends because I I pushed so far because I my thing became very trust-based. And so now I'm at a point where I don't really have friends. I live in the middle of nowhere on a huge block of land. R coming to this realisation now at 47, and it is interesting because it was just yesterday, actually, I had this moment where I went, I'm not an introvert. I am not someone that likes isolation. I actually need communication. I need people. I think I'm actually a massive extrovert who has damaged their way into isolation. And I say damaged my way because I think a lot of what has happened for even for the last 20 years has happened in my head. So while my trauma happened when I was a teenager and into some of my 20s, I carried it on in my brain. So I had these voices in my brain that kept saying, you're shit. No one, like no one. It's a big deal for me to do this podcast because I've had a voice in my head for a long time and I've wanted to do something like this for a couple of years that just, and I cancelled my online TV show because of that voice that kept saying, no one wants to hear what you have to say. No one mm -hmm. cares nobody wants to know what your issues are. And then I would attract people to me that would validate that, that when I mm. used to share and be authentic on Facebook, this is a long time ago, so it's like 12 years ago, I would be really authentic on Facebook. People would say, no one wants to hear that. Like you just just put up your lunch, put up your dinner, just put up the nice stuff. Don't Don't share the truth. And so what I really want to delve into with you is, how did you go from the emotional abuse and the physical abuse and the shame and the isolation and all of those voices, all of the, I'm assuming, punishing voices in your head? Because as a kid, I think we naturally take on board that we've done something wrong until we realise we didn't do anything wrong. Somebody else has done something wrong. How did you, how did you start healing that inner child? Like what conversations were you having? What kind of space did you give her to have those conversations? What were you saying to bring that trauma and that pain out? Really short message from me, if you could like and subscribe 
to this channel. That would be wonderful. Make sure you click out. You click out. To make sure you check out the links in the description below because that is where you'll find out about me and the free mentoring I am doing at the moment. And you'll also find out about the guests that I've had on the show today. So make sure you do click on those links in the description below. That's it for me right now. Let's keep watching the show. Thank you. So um, I began the process in counseling and I just began the conversations with the counselor. And in that process, I realized that my job was toxic. And in that toxic work environment that I was in, I put in a two weeks notice. Two weeks later, I enrolled in school and I wanted to become a licensed professional counselor. And so I began kind of that process of working towards that degree. And um, in my internship for my undergrad, I found this space um, through my church um, and it's a 12 step recovery program and it's called regeneration. I, I love the environment very welcome, very accepting people come in of all kinds of problems. They may just have an issue with pride. They may be just lying and don't want, they may be isolating and pushing people away. Anything from that to true drug addicts, alcohol addictions, some real heavy stuff. We all sat in a room. The women sat with the women, the men sat with the men, and everyone was given their time to speak. Now, I was in the space for one day before I realized for only one day, this place is where I know I have to unpack. Mm -hmm. And I just knew in my heart, it, the time is now and there's never going to be a better time. My counselor had, had I not done that previous work with him to unpack and prepare that ground and kind of peel back that layer. I don't know that I would have ever in that space been so willing to share, but I had talked some with him and peeled back some layers and allowed myself to be a little more vulnerable with him. But listening to these women and listening to not respond, but listening to just hear, because everyone was given three minutes to talk each time, and they would share a piece of their journey. And I sat in a room for them with them for over a year. And in that space of listening to their stories, not to give a response, not to give suggestions, not to give advice, but listening and truly offering space to other people, you learn so much from other people's stories because you're removed from the emotion of their story. And you can see how they're emotionally involved in their own story. Yet you can, in your mind, really see where they're getting hung up in their thoughts and their circumstances are two different things. And what their brain is offering them about their circumstance really is the issue, just like you mentioned. And so that, that space that they were given where it was safe, they learned to talk because it was safe space. Mm -hmm. And they would offer more and more and peel back layers and layers every single week, as did I, and unpack my story piece by piece. And as I unpack that, and as they unpack that, we became so free in that space to share and just walk away so much relief from just saying things out loud that we would never say before. And it was so healing to be offered space without being concerned anyone was going to say anything that would be hurtful. And that is the environment that I want to create in my mindset school community, because I want people to be able to, to share their stories. I want people to be able to feel safe in an environment where they can just open up and they can talk. And not worry about someone else giving them advice that they don't want to hear, but just to be able to release their story 
and listening and offering that space, you learn much about yourself. You learn so much about yourself and your own stories because you're able to see their circumstances and how they're responding to them. And it's really their thoughts that are driving them in the wrong direction, whether rather than the circumstances and the things that are coming at them in life outside, they think that this is the thing, but it's the thoughts, just like you said, it's the thoughts that are the thing. It's our thoughts about life circumstances that hold us back. And I didn't realize, you know, as an adult, until I was in my forties, I didn't realize that as an adult, I had the power to drive my car in whatever direction I wanted to. I could have unpacked all of this in my twenties. I could have unpacked all of this in my thirties, but instead I was just pointing at circumstances and pointing at more circumstances. And instead of doing that, I finally realized that my thoughts about my life circumstances are what are keeping me from having joy in my life. True, authentic joy that comes from the inside out. That circumstances are always going to come, but we can find joy and have joy in the depth of our heart, regardless of the circumstances that come. And there's life's always 50 50. You know, there's good days and there's bad days. And we can't keep that from happening. But what we can do is whenever things are 50 50, and it's one of those days that it's a negative day on, you know, things are, things are happening, things that we don't want to happen, whether it's, you know, a loss, whether it's something that's, you know, someone would consider really hard. It it's, doesn't matter. It's how we think and how we frame that situation in our mind. If you frame that negative situation that came at you in life, if you frame it in a way, okay, someone passed, I'm going to give myself space because that my heart is breaking from this grief. I'm going to give myself permission to grieve. And you offer that to yourself. Instead of pushing that away, you can process that so much better and so much healthier than trying to push things that are negative away. Decide for yourself. It's empowering. Decide that you're going to process that thing, whatever it is, and frame it in a way that serves you. Instead of having that negative rumination in our mind, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't be sad. I don't have time to allow yourself permission. If you need to take a day, take a day. Give yourself permission and make a decision. Does that make sense? It does. And what I'm wondering is how... So I'm big on the how. That's what I'm struggling with at the moment is the how. <laughs> the rumination, I'm very well versed in. Uh, I'm very good at it. And what I don't know is how to stop the ruminating. So it can be as simple as, um, oh, the other day the dog, we let our dogs out and didn't realise one of the chickens was in the house yard. So the dogs were chasing the chickens. And I had to chase the dog who was chasing the chickens and in the process fell over, broke my toe. And naturally there's this part inside of me that then I go down <clears throat> into the ruminating. I bought the dogs. I bought the chickens. Shouldn't have bought the dogs. Shouldn't have hatched the chickens. Made the decision to come here. And then it goes further. Then I my brain goes down the path of I never should have bought this house. I bought the house out of fear. What was I thinking? I'm really, like, I'm, I'm ridiculous. I'm hopeless. I'm stupid. I'm not. And then I go down the path of, well, it'd be good if I could start making money again. So then I can buy another house, but then what am I going to do? Nobody wants to see me. Nobody wants to hear me. Nobody cares about me. And it's just like this one thing over here happens and I end up going all the way over to here yeah. into hell. Um, how? 
how did you stop yourself or shift yourself or shift the ruminating going from here to here and going to hell, which I'm assuming you did at some point. I did. And I you did. don't know how did you stop that? How did you stop yourself from doing that? So we've learned from neuroplasticity and neuroplasticity is new, right? It's not something that was science that was believed long ago. Mm -hmm. It's new to the science industry where they know now that your brain can rewire. Mm -hmm. Your brain is neuroplastic and you can change all of that. And it's so exciting to know because all of these people that have been diagnosed with disorders, they have the capability to overcome and do things different. And I'm not saying there aren't medical disorders that remain with people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we have so much power. We have so many new neurons every single day. So the exciting thing is, you can do a few things. There's a few tools that you can use. Number one, I recommend doing a what I call a thought download or a brain dump. So listen to the thoughts that your brain offers you. Take 10 minutes every single day mm. and journal them and write them down. Don't change them. Don't clean them up. If it's a giant goal, like something like, I'm going to be a movie star. Don't change that. Write it down. Whatever your brain offers you, write it down. If it's so negative, you're like, I cannot believe my brain offered me that thought. Write it down, whatever it is. And so doing that thought download on a daily basis, you'll see reoccurring patterns. You'll see thoughts that keep coming to you on a daily basis. And writing that down and just start being curious about your brain and the questions that it's offering you, it really is empowering because some of the thoughts that we have that we ruminate on are questions. And what if we start focusing on and isolating out one question at a time and answering the question? Because I want you to do that thought download then I want you to just take one or two of those thoughts and I want you to process it. So process it means look at it and evaluate it. And so, so look at it and see, is this a fact? Because I think that this is a fact. Or is it a circumstance? Or is it a thought that my brain's offering me? So facts and circumstances are one thing. Thoughts are another thing. So decide, what is this? Get curious with your brain. When you began the process of that curiosity, that's step one of really thinking about what you're thinking about. It is so empowering to be in that space of thinking about what you're thinking about and why you're thinking about it. Don't be upset that you're thinking those thoughts. It's just something your brain is offering you. It's just handing you something. You don't have to accept it. You don't have to swallow it. You don't have to put it as part of your identity. Just think of it as something outside of you and begin to be curious about it. Huh, my brain's offering me this. And when you start that process, you do that thought download on a daily basis. And then you also begin to process some of those thoughts, you'll realize this thought doesn't serve me. It's not true because this is what it's saying. But that's not true. And decide, okay, so this is a, a circumstance. This is the thought that my mind's having about this circumstance. You know, you said you had to run after the dog, right? Mm. Is that mm. You didn't have to run after your dog. Even that is a thought. Do you see the difference? Mm. It's mm -hmm. not a fact. It's a thought. So many times we think things are facts when they're really thoughts. Your brain offered you, I have to run after this dog. 
but the dog could have been there and you not run after it. Then you didn't have to get a whole new house. <laughs> right? I'd have to get a whole new chicken. <laughs> <laughs> right. Possibly. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> but yes, sometimes, and, and that's a thing. You wanted, you didn't have to run after their dog. You wanted to run after the dog because you didn't want to buy a new chicken, mm. right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. you made a decision to run after the dog and then you were injured. But mm. it wasn't, you weren't injured because of the whole thing that your brain offered you after that. Some of that's going to be that road most traveled that our brain just maps those pathways out to the path of destruction. And you can interject that path of destruction, that spiral that your brain offered you. You can interject that by just getting curious about your brain. And that's the first step. I have a lot of other steps that go along with that in my community. I wish I could tell you all about all of them today, but- We don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But just that piece of it, mm. I promise it will help you. Just thinking about what your brain is thinking about, it makes you more intentional about your thoughts. It makes you get curious about what you're allowing space. There's brain space that we allow to go wherever it wants to go. And it holds us back from so many things that are good. Yes. The results that we want. Our thoughts can drive us in that direction. Our thoughts can drive us to towards the results that we want. And we've got to learn how to first be curious about our minds and what we allow to have space there. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. As the one thing that fell when you were talking was... When you said I didn't have to run after the dog, I heard, no, she's right. I wanted to run after the dog. The I have to run after the dog is the victim. The I want to run after the dog is the responsibility, the ownership of I want to run after the dog because I value the chicken, not I have to run after the dog because I don't want the chicken to die. Same outcome, caught the yeah. dog probably still would have broken my toe. Exactly the same outcome, but a completely different way of seeing it. Yeah. And, and what you just said, it seems a little more empowering, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, the yeah. feeling behind it. Mm. So some of the thoughts that we have, they cause us to have certain feelings. And those feelings we feel physically in our body very often. And so the thought that is driving us towards that feeling is what's keeping us from that action and result that we want to have in our life. Mm. So many times, so many times. Yeah. Hmm. I think I'm going to let that sit for a while. Yeah. That was a really good, um, it was a good tool, a good, a good moment. <laughs> yeah. That's and, a really and good I, shift. I promise that um, that thought download, mm. the things that your brain will just offer you if you give it space, it's, it's so eye-opening. If you will do that exercise, it's very eye-opening because you have dreams for your future that you don't even realize you have. And mm. you have thoughts that are keeping you from those dreams that you don't even realize that your brain offers you regularly and you just swallow it. And so it really are limitations often are because of the thoughts that we let just sit and take power over us in our brains. 
Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. <sighs> I don't know if I could take this anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's just kind of like it sat in such a good spot that I just want to sit with that. I want to sit with um, that, that the downloading, the brain dumping, and then also the shifting of the perspective. And like you said, taking a step back and actually looking, looking at the patterns in the thoughts and the questions that come up in, in your brain. And then also the um, redirecting, the shifting. And I think for me, it's looking at the brain dump and then going, how can I take these thoughts from the victim over to being more empowered, being more responsible? Because obviously the victim, for me, completely lacks responsibility, doesn't take any responsibility for any part of what's happened in my life. It's my life has happened to me, not mm. because I've made a choice to go down this path. It's just been this sequence of, well, I had to make this decision, then I had to make that decision, then I had to make that decision, and then I've had to make that decision, and then that's where the victim path, I think, adds to the ruminating of the thoughts. Mm -hmm. So to take that and to shift it into yeah. being more responsible but you didn't have to make those decisions. No, that is the victim that is making that statement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It all the whole you chose. You mm. were able to be empowered to make a decision. It's just like when I was a child and I self-protected. I chose to self-protect as a coping mechanism. But really, when I think of that, I'm so proud of myself as a child from getting through that, that I was able to cope and get through that. And I offer her so much love and compassion and have cried tears for her in my 40s of love and compassion for that child mm. and gratitude towards her for making that decision to cope and go through all of those years and to not see myself as a victim, but realize that I was victimized and accept that because mm -hmm. those are two different things. See, I, I don't believe that I envision myself as a victim. I believed that I never accepted. And a, a lot of people take different paths for this, but I, I rejected that I was victimized and never really processed all of that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to accept that I was victimized. And when I began to accept that, I was able to show love and compassion to that girl for going through that and offer her love. So we, we are able and it's empowering to realize that we make decisions because we empower ourselves to make decisions. Not I had to, but to, I get to, I yeah. get to raise my children on days that bring challenges. I get to raise my children in a way that other people may consider a hard day I get to, I get to do that mm -hmm. it's so much more empowering to think of it that way than oh I have to go in there and I have to discipline my child you know it's just it's not but I choose to I choose to go and offer discipline to my child because I love my child and just that shift in perspective and to think of the thought that isn't serving us, it limits us and it mm. keeps us and it holds us back.
Did you ever come from a space of punishing yourself? <clears throat> Did you notice that when you first started kind of diving into this work and looking at yourself? Did you notice that you came from a space of punishing yourself for oh. where you were and who you were and, and the choices that you'd made and then you've shifted it to this new perspective? Yes, I, I realized that um, through the process of this 12-step program called Regeneration, I they have a thing called inventory and you list out all, it's kind of digging deep and you just list out all of the harms to you, harms that you did to other people and you dig deep into that kind of stuff. And I didn't, I really didn't have like, animosity towards even my grandfather that was my abuser I had forgiven him but I was so shameful of myself so I throughout this entire time I had just self-blame and shame mm -hmm. and it was somehow how I coped and yes I that self-blame was a big part of my past and I had to, here I said had to, mm -hmm. I decided to, see, I have not, I'm still on my own journey, Kaylee, <laughs> yeah. but I decided to, I decided to make a shift and decided to look forward and began to allow that girl compassion and grace and just be grateful for everything that she offered me. Mm, beautiful. I felt when you said that, <clears throat> when you said I had to, and then you went, see, I chose to. I was feeling, I had this trigger and went, it's like this feeling and this voice that went, but that's so selfish to choose for yourself. It's it, 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 it For me, it sits in the, but if I start saying I choose to, then I'm being selfish. Whereas I had to, it's like, well, I have to do this. There's no, it's not selfish. It's not for me. It's because I have to do it. I have to do it for them or I have to do it for society or I have to do it for my mom or my dad or I have to do it for the story in my head. I have to do it. Keeps it outside of me. And bringing it in feels very selfish but then obviously there's this part that I understand that, yes, it is selfish, but that's important. It's actually important to take care of yourself, to yeah. own yourself, to be there for yourself. Being there for yourself is not being selfish, but we've been raised yeah. or I've been raised to believe that being there for myself and doing things that makes me happy is extremely selfish. Did you... Did you go through that same journey of hitting that trigger of this is like you had to push back against that? I'm being selfish doing this. Yes, absolutely. Um, there's a scripture that says, love your neighbor as yourself. I wanted to love my neighbor. I wanted to love others so well. I cared. I've always wanted to be in helping um, careers and do something to help others. It's, it's been something I've always been passionate about, but I was never able to do it well because I didn't love myself mm. and I, I hated myself. I couldn't look in the mirror at myself and feel love. And I don't think it's selfish at all. I used to hate myself so much. And because of that, I couldn't, I couldn't truly love others to the depth that I needed to. And now I think I'm extraordinary. I do. And people may say that's selfish, but where were they when I was hating myself for almost 40 years? Yeah. Where were they? I am now putting on my oxygen mask first on the airplane so that I can offer care to someone else sitting beside me if they can't care for themselves. I have to love myself so that I can love others well. If we don't offer ourselves that self-care, that love and compassion for ourselves, we truly can't 
have the capacity to love others well, we have to take the time to offer ourselves that love. It's so important. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like I could just keep talking and diving into this for hours. Um, yeah, but I'd really love to leave it there as the importance yeah. of self-care and self-love and sitting in that space of saying it's not only okay, it's fundamental and it's important to put yourself first, to love yourself first, to honour yourself first, so then you can go out into the world and be whoever you want to be from that space as opposed to going out into the world and being who everybody else wants you to be and then coming into yourself, which yeah. is horrible. Yeah. Mm. No more people pleasing. Yeah. Yeah. So can you share more about your mindset program? Yeah. So I have a online membership called the Mindset School. Mm -hmm. We offer um, group coaching and um, I do one-to-one -one as well, but my membership is with group coaching and I have a course that um, I'm still in beta, beta phase with my course and creating that, but um, you can find me at the mindsetschool.net and I absolutely love seeing women empowered and having breakthroughs and um, really changing their mind and finding that authentic smile that they've been missing for so long. So, Yeah, I really get that from the chat we've had today. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing yeah. so much about your story and your journey and delving deep. I've, I've walked away with some moments where I've gone, yeah, okay. It's, it, it it has helped. It's just added another layer of permission for me to go, it's okay to put myself first. It's okay that I went through what I went through and the shift in perspective that you offered me was because of that journey, you've become who you are now and I was listening to an interview on a diary of the CEO <clears throat> with Lucy this uh, yesterday, actually, and she shared something that really hit home for me, which was it was because of her trauma, it was because of her alcoholism that she has delved deep into who she is and realized the depth of happiness that she can have now. And Stephen asked her, he said, so do you think that if you hadn't gone through all of that, you would be in a better place now? And she said, no, it's because of the journey. It's because of the trauma. It's because of what I went through that I've actually realized a depth of happiness that I didn't even know existed. And she said, I don't think I could have found that if I hadn't gone through what I went through. Yeah. Someone, um, when I was on my journey, when I was in the middle of just digging all of that out, someone offered me that it was actually Cliff Ravenscraft. Amazing man. Um, he has a course called Free the Dream. It's great. And he offered me that I would one day be grateful for what I went through. And at the time I was like, uh, not a chance, <laughs> not a chance. My brain pushed that back and out the door. But today I can sit here and that conversation with him was not too far in the past, mm. but I've come so far. And by sharing my story with others and really, you know, coming out of my pit and tossing a rope to the next girl and offering her that rope 
and say, let's do this. Let's do it together. The level of compassion care that I can offer that girl is phenomenal because of what I journeyed through, because of what God's brought me through. Every single step of the way, I am grateful today for what I went through. If, if, you know, it's crazy to think that I sit here today and I say, I'm okay. I'm, I'm grateful for my story. Mm. I'm grateful because it helps me help others. So, yeah, I get it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for letting me share. Thanks for watching this episode with Peggy. I know it was it was really good. <laughs> I, I keep saying I really enjoyed it, but I'm actually I'm getting so much out of these conversations that I'm having uh, with this community of amazing people, human beings who are willing to share their journey with me. And I, I, I just have so much appreciation for them. So if you could please like and subscribe to this channel, I would really, really, really appreciate it. If you would like help coming into a space of awareness, if you would like support and you would like just some encouragement or you just want to have a conversation with me, go to lovecreatesfreedom.com. It will redirect to a Facebook group where I am doing free mentoring. And if you do want to donate because you are loving this and you understand this entire world, functions around money, I would really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mwah.